folklore, the beliefs, traditions and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present, but under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. The development of the printing press meant that in very quick time, literature became accessible cheaply to a very broad range of the population in developed countries, those who had learnt to read at least. With this came a new way of storytelling, and also, suddenly, a new way of disseminating and recording tales that had previously been passed on using purely oral means. Traditional tales, and new stories alike, could suddenly be preserved, and so, years later, many tales that might otherwise have been lost could now be enjoyed, studied, and further told. The spread of street literature in the United Kingdom began around the 16th century, and was a popular form of cultural entertainment right through until the middle to late part of the 19th when they began to be subsumed by the novel and other longer forms of printed matter. Throughout this time, however, the broadside in its many and various forms was an important medium for the dissemination of popular culture to the common classes. By popular culture, in this case, we can focus on many different areas, but particularly prevalent were those of entertainment, information and historical knowledge of varying degrees of accuracy, from unreliable to completely wrong. For the folklorist, or folk historian, these pamphlets are of particular interest as they form a record of popular culture of the time which may not have survived in any other forms. Whether or not we may find particularly Gothic folk motifs in this literature is not really in any doubt. When you consider that the popularity of street literature continued throughout Gothic periods of the Victorian, this is no surprise. I'm Mark Norman, folklore author and researcher. In this episode of the Folklore Podcast, we undertake a brief examination of the history and consumption of this type of street literature within the Gothic framework and then move on to look at a number of examples of chapbooks which took in this particular literary form. The centre of production for chapbooks, broadside ballads and the like, prior to the Great Fire, was in the area of the capital around London Bridge. From here, broadside ballads were sent out to retail at either a penny or a half penny on the streets of London. These small pamphlets were generally made from sheets of paper folded twice to form the chapbook format. Where these contained collections of songs, they were known as garlands. Gothic blue books and chapbooks are considered by many to be the stepchild of Gothic scholarship. The Gothic blue book was popular in the late 18th and early 19th century and was essentially an abridged version of a longer Gothic novel. Whereas many chapbooks still survive in various libraries, blue books are much rarer and only survive now in a few collections. The Gothic chapbook is generally considered to have flourished between 1770 and 1820, 
and many people blame the format for the decline of the canonical Gothic novel. But by the time that Poe was writing his short tales of terror, such as The Telltale Heart, in 1843, he had already mastered the techniques of Gothic psychology and action. Many scholars claim that the short Gothic tale, or chapbook, grew out of the earlier common broadside ballads. The short-form story or tale in the chapbook demonstrates the same residual oral-to-written tradition which came about through the recording of the garlands. This is the very embodiment of folklore field research in many ways. However, many scholars also often overlook the chapbook format because of their lack of sophistication or depth in literary aspects and their formulaic, insignificant approach. But as a record of the time and of the people, they have much to offer us as researchers. As I mentioned earlier, the target audience of the chapbook was the lower class. We can see this from the artistic style adopted in their pages, heavily repetitive narratives, an emphasis on adventure and an anecdotal style, many of the reasons, in fact, that they were looked down on by the higher classes and ignored by academic scholars today. We also find a frequent lack of subjectivity and heavy use of the fantastical and supernatural. I'll return to these aspects in just a moment, once we finish our brief historical overview. So, the common chapbook portrayed human beings as pawns in the hands of outside forces. Life was a lottery for the protagonists. There was a reliance on magic, fate and luck to decide the outcome of the tale. There were, however, also chapbooks which were aimed at the middle classes. There was a distinct split between the two types, with the latter providing a more reasoned and rational approach to their tales. All very interesting and proper, but arguably of less interest to the folklorist as the more sensational. The success and proliferation of the chapbooks came about through the phenomenon of the circulating library, as well as through direct sales. This is because the circulating libraries acted as fronts for publishing houses. The most famous example of this is William Lane's Minerva Press, a publisher which is still going strong today. Minerva Press opened in London in 1770, and by 1794 it had 10,000 items in circulation. Their success is summed up in a quote from Richard Sheridan's play The Rivals, where Sir Anthony Absolute says to Mrs Malaprop, Madam, a circulating library in a town is as an evergreen tree of diabolical knowledge. It blossoms through the year. Those who are so fond of handling the leaves will long for the fruit at last. Demand for materials continued to increase, of course, because the literacy rates amongst the lower classes continued to improve over time, and this thirst for the fruit of knowledge to which Sheridan refers increases. So, let's move on to see how the folkloric motifs of the Gothic can be dug out of the variety of chapbooks to which we can still refer today. Of course, we can find the motifs coming up in a variety of forms, some of these are more obvious than others. We know that many writers would weave aspects of tradition and folklore into their stories as a matter of course. Thomas Hardy was well known for it, for example, and the podcast episode Cockstrides and Carriages in Season 1 of the Folklore Podcast gives some examples of this in his work. And the same technique is found in many of the chapbook author's works. Here is an example which comes from Sarah Scudgell Wilkinson, 1779 to 1831, who was one of the most prolific writers of Gothic chapbooks. This plot comes from The White Pilgrim, written in 1818. Horatio, the Count of Castelli, lives with his wife Amabel and their two sons in a castle in Bern. Amabel has what is described as a fearful dream the night before the Count is due to leave to go on a business trip. He mocks her for her primitive superstitions. 
A servant tells him of the cries of screech owls and crows outside, which are known to be an ill omen, but he dismisses this too. He leaves to go on his business trip, and the family that he leaves behind find themselves defenceless to the schemes of the attendants in the castle, which prove to be wicked. A string of problems naturally befalls the Count on his trip also. There are obviously folkloric parallels here with the concepts of the fetch or the family banshee, and the common themes of animals foretelling death or disaster for particular families. In Devon, the Oxenham family were said to have a white bird which appeared outside the chamber of family members before a death was going to occur. This was recorded over a period of hundreds of years, and is well written about in the transactions of the Devonshire Association, and in many books. In a similar vein, robins are said to be unlucky in some places in the same way. The Yule edition of the Folklore Podcast discussed the motif of the robin and its associated superstitions. So what other themes can we find in some of the surviving chapbooks to give us an insight into folklore representation? We'll take a look at some of the most entertaining titles to illustrate some of the motifs. One element which is naturally very strong when we consider the historical period that we're looking at is the religious morality tale. As with many morality tales, we find that these draw on folklore to help to make their point. For example, we have Terrific Tales, written by Isabella Lewis in 1804. This is a series of short vignettes that purport to be true although the contents are fantastical and reveal a mix of both the supernatural and the moral Christian elements. One story, we can see, concerns an aristocrat of very inordinate passions, who is kidnapped by a spirit which arrives on horseback. The conclusion of the tale says that his abduction was a punishment for his excessive passions. These tales have repetitive use of devils, ghosts in chains, and warnings from purgatory, but they carry a constant assurance of the next life. This is the reason that they were so popular. The supernatural is not explained in stories such as these, but it is confirmed as real. The lower classes of the time could not accept the finality of death, and so the Gothic chapbook reveals the continuing power of the supernatural in the social imaginary. Aside from the mentions of the devil that you would expect from tales such as Faustus being retold, we find numerous examples where warnings are dispensed, often to the young, to keep them on the right track. The covers of these publications always gave a lengthy description of the contents of the story, designed as a selling point in the same way as modern book jackets, and they hint at the ways that folklore motifs are woven into the tale. In A Terrible and Seasonable Warning to Young Men, for example, we find the description of the story as being a very particular and true relation of one Abraham Joyner, a young man about 17 or 18 years of age, living in Shakespeare's walks in Shadwell, being a ballast man by profession, who, on Saturday night last, picked up a lewd woman, and spent what money he had about him in treating her, saying afterwards, if she would have any more, he must go to the devil for it. And slipping out of her company, he went to the Cock and Lion in King Street, The devil appeared to him and gave him a pistol, telling him he should never want for money, appointing to meet him the next night at the world's end at Stepney. Also how his brother persuaded him to throw the money away, which he did, but was suddenly taken in a very strange manner, so that they were fain to send for the Reverend Mr. Constable and other ministers to pray with him. Mr. Joyner then becomes penitent and is freed from evil. This is a typical example of using the devil to gain something, and then being saved by the church and set on the right path, and can be found in folk tales all over the world as a way of teaching right from wrong. 
Similar themes can be found in The Kentish Miracle and in the wonderfully titled A Timely Warning to Rash and Disobedient Children, which tells the tale of a young gentleman in the parish of Stepney in the suburbs of London that sold himself to the devil for twelve years to have the power of being revenged on his father and mother, and how, his time being expired, he lay in a sad and deplorable condition to the amazement of all spectators. Of course, morality tales may draw on various aspects of folklore in order to make their point, so we do find some crossover between them. For example, the devil motif is combined with more standard ghost fare in The Portsmouth Ghost, which tells of the appearance of the ghost of Madame Johnson after a sensational story where she falls in love with a sea captain who promises to marry her and then gets her pregnant. She sells herself to the devil, also to be revenged, and then rips open her own belly and leaves the child behind when the devil takes her body. Her ghost then brings doom upon the captain and his fleet of ships. Another story, called The Bloody Tragedy, uses the ghost motif alone to make its moral point. Not all of the tales of ghosts necessarily take a moral standpoint. Sometimes we find recollections of ghost sightings, which always take great pains to point out that they are true, such as a full, true and particular account, which is a telling of the events of the ghost or apparition of the late Duke of Buckingham's father, which several times appeared in armour to one of the Duke's servants, and for about half a year before foretold the Duke's death. This covers not only haunting folklore, but also its links with the foretelling of death in the same way as the fetch motif mentioned earlier. Another book tells the story of the Guildford Ghost, in which the spirit of Christopher Slaughterford appears to other men with a rope around its neck and a flaming torch in one hand and club in the other. Other characters who may be viewed as ungodly in some way were also used in morality tales. The Witch of the Woodlands is an example of this, telling of one Robin the Cobbler, who is punished for his evils in the same manner as Faustus, by his own devils. Like most of these chapbooks, it features a fine woodcut illustration of the story on the front page, in this case featuring all of the motifs that you would expect from a traditional witchcraft tale. We may find chapbooks that speak of charms, spells and the like from traditional witchcraft paths, in most cases, these seem to be authors putting into print rituals which were already popular and previously recorded. However, it is pleasing that some rituals appear in chapbooks for which there is no trace in the folklore record anywhere else. Some of these titles look at particular aspects, such as Dreams and Moles, which looks at the interpretation of these things, Old Egyptian Fortune Teller, and A New Fortune Book, which looks at many and various ways in which fortune-telling and interpretation can be used in the art of courtship, and features instructions on the new invented art of making the true and false love powder, and making the enchanted ring which will cause love. Other pamphlets look at the lives of some of the wise women and also include a number of their charms or rituals as well. We have titles such as The History of Mother Shipton and The History of Mother Bunch. The second one is beautifully summed up in John Ashton's 1882 book Chapbooks of the 18th Century. He writes, The History of Mother Bunch is not particularly interesting, except for its scraps of folklore, and both parts consist principally of receipts for girls to get husbands. Themes of supernatural creatures form some quite fun chapbooks. There is the more standard monster such as the mermaid, featured in The Wonder of Wonders, and then there are the much more outlandish tales, such as this one, recorded in The Miracle of Miracles, 
which again purports to be a true account of Sarah Smith, daughter of John Simmons, a farmer who lately was an inhabitant of Darken Parish in Essex, that was brought to bed of a strange monster, the body of it like a fish with scales thereon. It had no legs, but a pair of great claws, talons like a lion's, and had six heads on its neck. One was like the face of a man, with eyes, nose and mouth to it, the second like the face of a camel, and its ears cropped. Two other faces like dragons, with spiked tongues hanging out of their mouths. Another had an eagle's head with a beak instead of a mouth at the end of it, and the last seeming to be a calf's head, which ate and fed for some time which monster has surprised many thousand people that came there to see it. Daily spectators flock to view it, but it was by command of the magistrates knocked on the head, it doesn't specify which one, and several surgeons were there to dissect it. This chapbook also contains a funeral sermon for the woman who gave birth to this creature, describing her as being disobedient to her parents, and one that was mightily given to wishing, cursing, and swearing, as well as having a very wicked liver. Again, this book tells that it should serve as a warning to disobedient children, and hence serves as another example of using folklore, superstition, and the supernatural to teach a moral tale. We may also find various folk histories within the chapbook canon, such as tellings and retellings of the legends of such characters as St George, John Barleycorn, Simple Simon, and Robin Hood, among many others now popular within folklore as well as fairy tales, nursery rhymes, and more classic literature. The chapbook pamphlets and similar publications provide a fascinating snapshot of the place of literature at the time of their publication, but also provide us with an interesting insight into the uses of common folklore motifs within the Gothic period of the age. The surviving publications, I would suggest, merit more examination by folklorists, as well as other cultural historians or scholars of literature so that we can pull out and note all of the uses and records of folklore within them. After all, we know that many traditional witchcraft charms exist only in their pages. Who knows what else might be waiting to be unearthed again? This episode of the Folklore Podcast, the first of Season 2, was written and presented by me, Mark Norman. You can find out more about my work and research by following my Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash marknormanfolklore. The Folklore Podcast's art director is Melissa Martell. Find out more about her work at www.mdmcreate.com As always, an electronic magazine supplement is available for this episode. In this case, it features many of the chapbook covers and woodcut illustrations which have been referred to. This is available from the Folklore Podcast's website, www.thefolklorepodcast.com by clicking on the supplements page. Remember that patrons of the Folklore Podcast from as little as $1 a month receive all of our electronic magazine supplements absolutely free on our Patreon page. To access these and become a patron of the Folklore Podcast, please visit www.patreon.com slash thefolklorepodcast Remember that patrons from $5 a month upwards also receive an additional mini-episode each month, which is available on the Patreon page. You can, of course, support the Folklore Podcast without spending any money. All of our episodes are free, 
and will continue to be so. And to help us to continue to grow and develop, please share our social media and share our podcasts via your pages on Facebook or Twitter. And please give a good review of any of our episodes on iTunes or wherever you receive your podcasts. Finally, to get all of the up-to-date news and to hear about forthcoming guests, future subjects and anything else related to the podcast before we publish it on our social media, please sign up for our free newsletter via our website. Thanks for listening. See you next time.